It's my great pleasure um, to be awarding the, or presenting the Rayleigh Medal today to Professor David Thompson. The increase in rail traffic and the dramatic development of high-speed rail networks across the world is leading to an increased need to understand and control railway noise and vibration. Professor David Thompson is a leading international authority who has worked at the forefront of his area of research for 35 years. His international standing has been recognised widely, for example, by researchers across Europe who have wanted his involvement in numerous EU projects and, more recently, in China, where a number of research teams are keen to cooperate with his group at ISVR. The scientific impact of his research is evidenced by his outstanding publication record. His research has led to the publication of the definitive book in this area, which has sold over 800 copies, one of them to me. And it's been cited 600 times and has also been translated into Chinese. He is a joint editor of the second edition of Fundamentals of Sound and Vibration, published in 2015, and has published over 150 referee journal papers. Throughout his work, David's approach has been to develop fundamental understanding leading to the solution of practical problems. He has worked on many aspects of railway noise, including wheel and rail noise, rail dampers, ground vibration from trains, and aerodynamic noise from high-speed trains. Although railways are the main area of his research, David's work has covered a wide range of different aspects of noise and vibration. He is also a very keen educator in the field of acoustics and vibration. This is demonstrated through his training of PhD students, with 35 having graduated over the last 20 years. In 2015, he won the Faculty Supervisor of the Year Award. Clearly, David Thompson is a very able scientist who has made an outstanding contribution to the area of railway acoustics and vibration. For his research work at the forefront of railway noise over the last 35 years and his dedication to communicating his knowledge to the next generation, the IOA is delighted to present David with the 2018 Rayleigh Medal. David, would you like to come up? I'll now hand over to David um, for his Rayleigh Medal lecture, On Track for a Quieter Future. Where do I start? Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, IOA. Thank you, um, everybody. It's a real honor, real pleasure to um, be able to uh, address you today and to receive this um, amazing award from, from the IOA. Thank you very much. Um, on track to acquire, for a quieter future. I, um, I thought I ought to change the title. <laughs> There's a question mark. Um, what I want to show you is, is some results of research over the last 35 years, um, hopefully leading to a quieter future, but there are obstacles along the way, and so I have to leave a question mark. So I will, I will give a brief introduction to the field of railway noise, and then I will focus on three areas which have been among the areas I've worked on over the years, rolling noise, aerodynamic noise, and ground vibration. And I want to include um, failure as well as success, because I think it's important to recognize that things don't always go to plan. So we'll come back to that. Railway noise is not a new problem. This quotation is from 1825, nearly 200 years ago, when the railways were first beginning. And um, 
So this quotation in the, the Leeds Intelligencer, judge my friend, my mortification whilst I'm sitting comfortably at breakfast with my family, and in a moment my dwelling is filled with dense smoke and nothing is heard but clanking iron and blasphemous song and curses of the directors of these infernal machines. A noise complaint. Um, and then we have a very interesting case from the 1800s, um, Haddon Hall in Derbyshire, the um, Midland Railway, as it became, wanted to build a line past Haddon Hall, and um, there's Haddon Hall on the map, and there's the railway line, and there's a tunnel. And there doesn't need to be a tunnel, but the tunnel was built because the owner of Haddon Hall insisted that he should not be able to see or hear the railway line from his house. So they had to build a tunnel. Well, that's what we do today. again today. We have to build tunnels to avoid um, noise problems. Well, if we go back um, a while, the, the, the UK rail network reached its peak in, um, in 1914, over 100 years ago, and then we saw a steady decline. And the beaching cuts are quite famous for the fact that the rail network was, was cut, and the um, network is probably less than half what it was at, at its peak. When I joined Railway Acoustics in, in 1982, uh, it was just as this report came out called the Serpel Report, and we were quite worried by this in BR research. It was potentially, under that particular government, spelling the end of the railways as we knew it. They proposed a number of options, but one of them was to cut the network back just to three main lines. Fortunately, that didn't happen. But um, that, that was the position as when I started. There was very few people working on, on railway noise around the world. Um, the railways were not in the ascendancy. And you could say, well, a, a, a disused railway is a quiet railway. Um, but that's, that's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to produce uh, sustainable transport that is also quiet. So railways, thankfully, didn't go into that um, that abyss. We, we've seen redevelopment of railways. Um, passenger journeys in the UK have more than doubled in the last 20 years, and we have new lines, the, the Channel Tunnel Rail Link, HS1, Crossrail, the Elizabeth Line, HS2, Jubilee Line Extension, and so on. Um, well, that leads to potential noise problems. We have um, in London, interesting case of the um, night tube, where um, running the tube for good political reasons through the night on Friday and Saturday um, means that people who live near the, the, these particular lines are being disturbed. And rooms that could have been used as bedrooms no longer can be used as bedrooms. It's quite a, an important um, issue and means that we need to understand where this, you know, how, how we can control this um, this noise and vibration. Um, as well as the UK, then if we look around the world, then China is a particular example of um, growth of the railway network. In 2007, they opened their very first high-speed line just before the Beijing Olympics. And they now have more than 25,000 kilometers of high-speed railway, which is more than the rest of the world put together and they've recently started running at up to 350 kilometers per hour. There are many cities in China with, with metro networks. We've heard of Beijing and Shanghai, but, and the Beijing metro will have um, 1,000 kilometers of, of metro line by 2020. But there are many other cities with similar um, metro networks. So if, if we look at this expansion of, of, um, of railways, both um, development of new lines and also intensification of use. Um, it, it's all a good thing for sustainable transport, low carbon transport. Um, it's good for uh, transferring people from air traffic to, to, to rail, especially over um, moderately long distances. But noise. Rail is noisy, it's perceived as noisy. And if people want to object to a new railway line, then the easiest thing to do is to complain about the noise. That might not be what they're annoyed about. It might be just they don't want the railway line. 
but um, complaints about noise are, are, um, are increasing. Railway noise is relatively localized, close to the lines, but um, the people it does affect, obviously, it affects a lot. Okay, we've got a little exam question for you. Um, how much of the power of a train is converted into noise? And um, I don't expect you to shout out the answer, but let's work through it. Let's do a little example. So sound pressure level at 25 meters, typical level 80, 40 dB-ish. Um, sound intensity, convert from your decibels. You can all do it, can't you? It's about 2.5, 10 to the minus four. Um, so how much sound power per vehicle? We have to do a little sum with a, um, a cylinder, half cylinder, length 20 meters, radius 25 meters. So pi r times l times intensity comes out as 0.4 watts. What's the power of a train? Typical rating about 500 kilowatts per vehicle. So acoustic efficiency, divide the two. Remember it's kilowatts, not watts about one millionth. And that is quite key to what we're dealing with in noise control in railways and in many other fields, is that the proportion of energy converted into noise is so tiny that already the system is fairly optimized in terms of controlling it. So ach achieving noise control is difficult. That is, that's the key. Uh, well, traditionally, the, the solution to railway noise is to build noise barriers. It's, um, it's a fairly dumb way of doing it, but it works. An example from Holland, um, where I spent some time, they built a new high-speed line. In 125 kilometers of route, there are 100 kilometers of noise barriers. That's allowing for both sides. A lot of noise barriers. Some of them are up to 10 or 12 meters high. Um, and in fact, there, there was still problems when they opened the line because the, the line was open, the train at the bottom right was not a high-speed train, it was a conventional train because the high-speed trains were built and didn't work and had to be sent back to the manufacturer. And so the noise was higher than it should have been and there was uh, still a lot of problems. The, the rationale behind a lot of my work over the years has been can we do this, can we pr produce effective noise control at the source instead of having to build these big noise barriers with the cost and the visual intrusion uh, involved in, in doing that? Control at source can be more cost effective. So the, the, the motivation for my work has always been um, to try to understand the um, sources and to, to deal with them. We have to recognize that railways will not be silent unless we close them, which we don't want to do. More traffic, more speed means more noise, and it's a social obstacle to railway development. So we have to reduce noise, preferably without increasing cost, and that is it's quite difficult, it's probably impossible, but at least without increasing cost too much. And to do that, we need to understand the noise. It's a very difficult problem if it's so finely balanced that it's only one millionth of the sound power. We need models to understand to be able to develop solutions. And we need appropriate models. Well, a model always involves approximations. I heard it said recently that uh, all models are wrong, but some models are useful. Um, so we have to live with those approximations. What is an appropriate model is one which is, um, involves enough of the physics that we can understand the problem, but not too much, not too complicated, that we just get lost in the detail. So it's trying to find this balance of appropriate models that, that can give us understanding and, and lead to noise reduction. So I want to show you some examples. Um, there's no equations, uh, just, just lots of pictures, but um, an overview of these three areas, rolling noise, aerodynamic noise, and ground vibration. Um, and if we, if we have time, I've got another example from curve squeal. 
So rolling noise first. Um, rolling noise is the noise you get when the wheel rolls along the rail. So I think we can. Okay, familiar noise. Um, question: Is that the wheel or the rail that's making that noise? What do you, what do you think? I mean, it's, you hear it before it comes. That suggests it's the rail. <laughs> noise, I've got a dry throat, but that, that is it's probably more like the wheel, I don't know. So it's, it's probably both. Well, just listening to it, you can't really tell. And using instrumentation, it's very difficult to tell. But using appropriate models, validated models, then we can start to dig down into it. So it, it turns out that the the noise is actually due to both the wheel and the rail. It's caused by vibration. The vibration is induced by the roughness of the surface of, of the wheel and the rail. The roughness, we call it roughness, is um, something very small in amplitude. But because we're going over it at quite a high speed, the velocity therefore becomes well, the because it, it's then high frequency, the velocity becomes higher, and it produces vibration amplitudes which are quite significant in terms of noise radiation. So amplitudes typically are microns. Um, the surface of the rail and the wheel look very smooth, very shiny, but they are subtly wavy, and that produces this um, noise. So we developed this model. It's, it's called TWINS. It's called TWINS because I have twin daughters, uh, as well as because it's called this track wheel interaction noise software. My twin daughters are now 27, so it's quite an old model. I um, can always tell when it was, when it was first produced. Um, the, the idea of the model is to bolt together a number of sub-models which are at an appropriate level to uh, give you this physical insight. So the input is the roughness, it's modified in some way by the contact. It leads to interaction forces, which generates vibration of the wheel and the rail, and therefore sound radiation. As far as the wheel is concerned, the wheel is um, a resonant structure, very lightly damped. I have one with me. It's only one-fifth scale, but um, I couldn't bring a full-size one. It's too big. So. Beautiful, isn't it? Um, quite a long uh, reverberation time, very light damping. Um, therefore, the modes of vibration of the wheel are, are quite important in, in the whole sound radiation and the thing that we heard as the train goes past. Although it is very lightly damped, once it is coupled to the rail, I don't know if we can do this thing. Just sit it on the, there. Oh, no, it still does it as well, but it's, it's more damped, okay? If we couple it to the rail, it's more damped. So lightly damped is not quite uh, the whole picture. There's more subtlety to do with the interaction, and we have what we call a kind of apparent rolling damping once we couple the wheel and the rail together. The shape of the wheel is quite important, and the excitation due to this roughness is in the vertical direction, but it is the out-of-plane motion which causes most of the sound radiation. And if the wheel is non-symmetric, then we get more of that out-of-plane motion. So an ideal wheel would be perfectly symmetrical, and then we don't get so much sound. Not so easy to do in practice, but it's, um, well, th there are some subtleties. So if, if you have a traditional braking system, the wheel needs to be able to expand thermally. So you need, um, you need a curved web to allow it to expand. Because of the curved web, you get more noise. If you have disc brakes, you can have a straight web, and um, it can be quieter. So that's the basis of modern design. It's a straight uh, wheel like this one. The track is quite different. If you hit the track, it doesn't go ding like that. It goes thud. So you would think a resonant structure that, that's got a very long reverberation time, very light damping, compared with a track that goes thud, how much noise is going to be produced by each one? You might think it's going to be all the wheel. Well, 
actually be wrong. The rail is very important, um, as we'll see in a moment. The most important aspect of the rail is the connection between the rail and the foundation, which is called the rail pad. And I have one of those here. Um, it's a piece of rubber. Now, you know, people say that rubber is, is a silent material, but it's, it depends what you do with it, okay? Th th this, is, um, this is actually quite a soft rail pad, um, but as rail pads, as rail pads go, but it's, um, yeah, it can make a lot of noise, and that's what tires do when they hit the road. Um, but of course, if, if we were to use it in the right way, then rubber can be isolating. Let's see if we can do this. So rubber can isolate, and if used in the right way, then rubber can be a quiet material. So the rubber between the rail and the sleepers isolates the, the rail from the sleeper. That's a good thing. What's not so good is it then means the rail can vibrate more. So you get waves propagating along the rail, and we heard at the beginning that train coming, we heard the train coming before it came because the waves propagating along the rail. So the more rail vibrates with each wheel, the more noise we're going to get from each wheel. It's like making a bigger loudspeaker. Um, the foundation, the sleepers are important also, but if we have good isolation, then they're less important. If we look at the interaction between the wheel and the rail, I've said, well, you know, the wheel's got resonances. You can see those big peaks up there. Whoops. That's, yeah. This is a frequency response function of the wheel and the rail. The, the resonances at high frequencies are the wheel modes, and they are what we heard in the sound at high frequencies, a whew, 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 whew noise, that's the wheel resonances. But where the rail has the highest mobility, the highest um, dynamic response, which is over quite a broad frequency range, here between 100 and 1,000 hertz, the rail is going to take all of the excitation from the roughness. So imagine this little roughness between the wheel and the rail. It can do two things. It can push the rail down or the wheel up. And in that region where it says rail mobility largest, it pushes the rail down. So the rail just vibrates and not the wheel. So in that region, that frequency region, the noise from the track actually is, is dominant. And then it depends on these rail pads as to how far it goes down the track. So soft pads allow the rail to vibrate over a long distance. Stiff pads localize it, but increase the vibration of the sleepers. Well, we measured some, some of these decay rates, how, how rapidly the, the rail vibration decays with distance in a test track we have in Southampton. We put different pads in the same track, and th those are the results. So where we have a higher decay rate, we have less noise, or lower decay rate, more noise. So increasing the rail pad stiffness can reduce the noise, or increasing it can um, increase the noise. And th this picture was something we produced about 20 years ago. It shows that yeah, if, you, if you make the pad softer, you're going to get more noise. If you make them stiffer, you're going to get less noise. The optimum is at quite a high value of pad stiffness, high, much higher than the one I've got here. Interestingly, in Belgium, they have just invented a, uh, a noise control solution, which apparently gives them 3 dB benefit, and they're installing it across the whole network, and it is simply a stiff rail pad. Okay, well, it's, it's, um, if as long as it solves other problems, then that, that's, that's, um, that's a good way to go. But there are other reasons for using soft rail pads, and amongst them they are to protect the sleepers from impact loading. Um, if you have a wheel flat that goes ka-chung, ka-chung, ka-chung every time it goes around, that will uh, damage the sleepers. So that's why the, tr the, the rail authorities tended, have tended to go to softer rail pads. Uh, here's our test track. We, we did some interesting measurements where we measured at different temperatures and the, the decay rate is temperature dependent because the rubber, the stiffness varies with temperature. In the cold, it is much stiffer than it is in the warm. And we found that translates into a 3 dB noise increase if you go from zero to 30 degrees. 
and we verified that also by field measurements. The, the poor student who did the measurements there um, actually left without finishing his PhD, but that's another story. <laughs> we, we did some interesting measurements at a site along the south coast, um, Fishbourne, where there was a, a track renewal, and the, the old track was replaced by a new track, uh, just happened to be happening, we, we took advantage of it. Um, and you might think a new track would be quieter. Well, it's the same story. The, the old track had stiff rail pads, the new track had these modern soft rail pads, like the one I've got with me. And the vehicles have got relatively small, straight webbed wheels that are a really good design. So the wheel noise is relatively small, small as we'll see in a moment. Um, slight difference in roughness, but basically the track noise went up by 3 to 4 dB which was not a surprise to us, really. <coughs> and the model predicts that um, really quite well. So the two thin lines are the renewed track, the two thick lines are the uh, unrenewed track, prediction and, and measurement. So we have quite a good confidence in, in the model. It, it pr predicts the measured effects quite well. Um, and so we can use that to say, well, how much noise is coming from the wheel and the track. And in this particular example, um, so that the rail noise is dominant there in the middle frequencies. I said between 100 and 1,000 hertz in particular, where the rail is going to move with the roughness. Uh, wheel noise more at high frequencies. If you look at the overall A-weighted level, then the wheel contribution in this case is about 7 dB less than the track contribution. So for a modern wheel, which is quite quiet, and a modern track, which is quite noisy, putting it together, there's a lot of potential to reduce the noise if we deal with the track specifically. And we'll look at some examples in a moment. Um, and I just put this slide here because I think it's quite fun. So we made a, a one-fifth scale uh, model track, which we could test in our reverberation chamber to uh, try to improve uh, still further the... Um, acoustic radiation models of, of, of the wheel and the rail. Okay, well, the, if the model tells us uh, the contributions of the noise from the different components, we can also then use it to adjust parameters to um, identify noise control. So, first of all, we could look at uh, remo reducing the roughness, and the effect of braking system is one which is quite important in continental Europe, where a lot of freight wagons still have cast iron tread brakes, because that, until recently, was the requirement. If you wanted to run your train from one country to another, you had to have this braking system. Very noisy, uh, because it leads to uh, a roughness, a corrugation on, on the wheel surface. So changing the braking system can give you this reduction. Well, in the UK, we knew that 35 years ago, and it happened by accident, but it's, it's been the case that we use tre uh, disc brakes and the noise is, is reduced already. The next uh, area after roughness is to look at either the wheel response or the track response. For the wheel, we can look at the uh, damping or the, or the shape or the um, shielding options. Um, just so two examples. So looking at the shape, uh, three different cross-sections. You wouldn't necessarily guess from the cross-sections which is the quietest. We've said that a straight symmetrical wheel is, is good. It turns out the one on the left, which looks kind of nearly straight and symmetrical, is not very good because it's quite thin. And so it actually has quite high modal response. And the one on the right is uh, so-called shall optimitis, um, noise optimized. We did some tests on that in a, a workshop in Germany and it was actually written on the side of the wheel, shall optimitis, and one of the workshop guys came up to it and hit it with a big hammer and said, shall optimitis, nine. <laughs> well, it, it, it does help, but damping helps more. Um, and adding damping, you've, you've got, this is a kind of key aspect, if, if the wheel is so lightly damped in the lab that you put some damping treatment on it, you might think you're going to get really good benefit but in the field, you get much less. And that's because there is already this damping caused by the coupling between the wheel and the track. You have to overcome that to give noise benefit. But nevertheless, these kind of solutions 
can give um, quite good noise benefits. But in our case, it's the track which is important, um, most important. And um, I'm going to talk about rail dampers, but first of all, to a couple of um, cases that didn't really work. So when I worked at British Rail Research back in the 80s, we did some parameter studies and we found that if you made the rail smaller, you should have quite significant noise reduction because you reduce the surface area, but you also reduce the radiation efficiency. The concept was good. Um, unfortunately, it was taken away by our boss to his boss to his boss to the steel company who started making it before we'd actually done any design work. And the, the result was called hush rail, um, and it uh, didn't work. So it, it didn't work because it, it was implemented in the wrong way and because it wasn't f properly designed. It, we hadn't sort of finished, if you like. There was another instance later in, in Holland where they designed a small rail uh, in a slab track, and that did give quite a large noise reduction. Another, uh, another uh, fail was um, some tests which, th this was an idea from, from one of our bosses, and he said, wouldn't it be a good idea to bury the rails in sand? And the idea would be that they would have some damping from the sand. Uh, well, in fact, they've already got quite a lot of damping, so it didn't really help. And maybe it would shield the sound radiation. And to uh, stop the sand being sucked into the engines, um, they had this idea of, of sealing it with wood glue diluted one-to-one, -one. so we have these big barrels of wood glue, and how do you apply wood glue to a load of sand on a track where well, you have to use green plastic watering cans, so that's me in a white suit applying wood glue to sand on a, a, a slab track. Anyway, the first train came down, and um, the sand, which is slightly wet, went Ugh. <laughs> And it stopped damping the rail, and it didn't really seal it, it stop the noise. And what was worse was the train carried on and had to put the brakes on rather suddenly and they put wheel flats on every wheel and we had to abandon the tests. So another classic fail. <laughs> However, we got it right in the end in, in a European project called Silent Track together with British Steel which became Chorus, which became Tata, which became British Steel. Um, we developed this rail damper. The one on the left was the original design and then it became a, a, a clip-on design that's not quite the final version, but this has been um, installed on about 150, 160 kilometers of track ar around the world. And depending on the track you install it on, it can give noise reductions up to five or six dB. This is the, the only case I've experienced where if you predict a certain noise reduction, you actually get more than what you predict. Normally, if you, if you as an acoustician, you predict, we're, okay, we're going to get a noise reduction of 5 dB, you know you're only going to get 3. Yeah? There's always something else that gets in the way. But in this case, we got more, and the reason was because it was very hot on the day we measured in Czech Republic. Um, so 5 or 6 dB, the, the Netherlands Railways have installed a lot of this rail dampers because on their track they have quite stiff rail pads. It should only give one or two dB reduction. I think they found two to three. But that gives, that gives them the opportunity to run more trains because in the Netherlands there is an acoustic ceiling that defines how many trains you can run. So just a, a two dB improvement means they can already run 70% more trains. Okay, that was railway noise. That was the longest um, part I wanted to talk about. Um, Aerodynamic noise next. And this is an area I've only recently got involved in. Um, it's a totally different specialism, but um, very, very interesting. So as you go to higher speeds, the rolling noise, which is a 30 log V curve, um, eventually is taken over by a higher speed dependence, which is potentially about 80, dB, 80 log V. Um, and this is caused by aerodynamic noise, flow noise over, over the train. Now, I have a recording here. This is not necessarily aerodynamic noise, but... You 
is that aerodynamic noise or is that rolling noise? I mean, it's actually probably still rolling noise. If we go back here, then at 300 kilometers per hour, the aerodynamic noise is probably still away below the, the, um, the rolling noise. But if we go to higher speeds, then it starts to become important. So higher speed dependence, therefore more important at high speeds. This transition speed, where the two sources are equal, it used to be said it was 300 kilometers per hour. I think we've now come to the conclusion it's more like 360. Um, but it depends a bit on the design of train. There are many different sources on the train. Um, one of the most important ones is the pantograph, which is the electric current collector on the top of the train, which is not the most important source on the train until you build a noise barrier. And then it's the one you see at the top. So in Japan, a lot of work's been done on pantographs because they have noise barriers everywhere. And you see the pantograph, nothing else. Um, and it's going to be pretty important for HS2 for, for similar reasons. Different tools we can use. We can use experimental methods. We have a microphone array we've built at ISVR, which um, allows us to identify noise sources on the train. Quite complicated processing. You only get a very, very brief signal to analyze. You have to remove the Doppler shift um, and, and so on. Um, we can use numerical techniques, and I have a number of students. I'm collaborating with a colleague, uh, Jiwei Hu, in aerodynamic, aer aer aeronautics department. Um, and together we've supervised a number of students in this area. Computational fluid dynamics is very um, computationally intensive, large computation times. So I have students running cases for a month just to get the flow over a small piece of cylinder. But you need to do it in a very detailed way to be, get reliable results. Um, we did look at a, a, a bogey, so the wheel sets of, of, of a train, but that had to be done in a simplified way at reduced scale. And even that took um, months to, to calculate. So it is quite promising still, but it's, it's slow. We've also used experimental techniques, and we can set up a low noise wind tunnel in our anechoic chamber. We're also building a, a new dedicated one in our new, new um, campus. And in this case, we're testing a scale model of, um, a, a, of a bogey as it would be under the bottom of a train. And it's quite useful for estimating the noise spectra. We also collaborated with uh, colleagues in Japan. I had a student who had a, a Japanese girlfriend, and he was quite keen to spend some time in Japan. Um, while he was there, he got engaged. I mean, it was all quite sweet. He, he, um, he's Spanish. It's quite funny. He, he's taller than me, and she's really, really short. But <coughs> The, the, um, the, the six months he spent in Japan, he was promised some wind tunnel time, and he, he was allowed two days in this wind tunnel. And he spent three months preparing for those two days and three months analyzing those two days. And in the two days, he got some beautiful data. So it was really efficient. This is the wind tunnel, and it looks similar to the one before, except that in the ring there, there is a Japanese person. I mean, Japanese people are quite short, but this is actually a huge facility, OK? Um, and so th this was a model train. It's a one to seven scale model train. I should have put it in. There's another photo of the whole team sitting on the train. It's, it's quite a big structure. And underneath that, they, they mounted different configurations of train bogey and measured with a microphone array. They had to shield the noise from the, the inlet. Um, and to summarize, one of the most important conclusions was that the noise from the bogey region actually is well shielded by the fact that the, the flow is, um, or the flow is shielded by, the, by its position under the train. But as soon as you start projecting out from the side, the noise level goes up. So this is projecting from within the bogey region out to 100 millimeters. OK, this is at 1 7 scale, so it's 700 millimeters at full scale. But that gives you more than 10 dB increase in noise overall from the bogey region. Um, and the, the other approach we've used, which is something I started with, with um, Malcolm Smith a while ago, was to use uh, so-called component-based methods. So you, you take simple measurements or analytical expressions or even CFD results for components, 
and this was done for aircraft first of all, for the landing gear, and then you add them together and you get quite a good estimate of the, the noise. And for the pantograph, that works really well. So this is uh, the same student, Eduardo, and his prediction of the noise from, from a pantograph compared with the measurements in a wind tunnel. And the, the agreement is, is quite remarkable. So that was aerodynamic noise, um, an up and coming theme and, and one which um, we're really working on quite intensively at the moment. Thirdly, I wanted to talk a little bit about groundborne noise and vibration. Um, ground vibration is something we experience in two different ways. We can feel it as vibration at low frequencies, mostly an issue for surface railways, or we can hear it as a rumbling noise. And um, this is the noise in a particular hotel in London that I stayed in, and as I was checking out in the morning, uh, it was behind a, a lady who was checking out, and the, the, the desk asked her, you know, did you have a good stay? And she said, oh, I didn't really like the noise of the trains. And I said, I actually quite enjoyed it. <laughs> well, okay. Um, since, that was recorded since I stayed there. I had a student who, who spent um, the back end of his, of his PhD going around cheap hotels in London recording the noise from the, from the underground. And um, he had to anonymize the hotels in his thesis. But it was um, quite an interesting exercise. To predict that kind of noise, we have a range of different models, um, which generally work by coupling models for the train, the track, and the soil. We use quite detailed models for the track and the soil. Um, we can include layered ground structure, tunnel structure, and so on. But we have to recognize that however good the model, because of uncertainties in the input parameters, particularly the soil properties, there are still quite large uncertainties in, in those predictions. So the models tend to be more useful in predicting relative effects. We can say what happens if we change the track structure or we introduce some other mitigation measure. But to give an absolute prediction, we have to rely on measurements quite a lot. Um, so I've got a postdoc who's very good at making these animations, so I wanted to put them in. Um, Vangelis. So this is the response to a ground to uh, harmonic load on the track. And you can see the waves propagating out on the ground surface. Uh, as soon as that load moves along the track, the waves still propagate outwards. But we experience then a Doppler shift, as we do in, in air, but we do in the ground as well. The Doppler shift means that the response at a position on the ground contains multiple, well, the Response to one frequency on the track is multiple frequencies on the ground. So we have to integrate up all those frequencies. And th this is the best one. Um, so we have a, um, a train running along the track. It's being experiencing this roughness, so it's causing excitation of the, of the wheels. And that then causes this response of a position next to the track, which contains all of these frequencies mixed up together. Um, we can approximate that by a train which is stationary and we pull the roughness through underneath it. That's not quite the same because then the response is only at the frequency we put in. How much difference does it make? Well, if we look at the narrow band response, it makes quite a big difference. But if we convert to third octaves, then the response actually is fairly similar. So the, the, the moving roughness model, the second model, is quite a good approximation in many situations. And it's more um, computationally efficient. We can use that model to estimate, for example, the vibration isolating effect of different track systems. These are just examples of different track systems and the, the vibration benefit at, at higher frequencies. For groundborne noise, that's quite effective because we can isolate the track with a low resonance frequency. We can get good isolation in the groundborne noise frequency region. <coughs> That was an analytical model. It involves solving a lot of complicated equations, but it's basically analytical. Um, we can also use numerical models. 
So we've developed a, what we call a two and a half dimensional finite element boundary element model. So this is a two dimensional finite element mesh. And the third dimension is expressed as different wave numbers. So we sum up the effect of different waves in the third dimension, do a Fourier transform to recover the response. Much more efficient than a full 3D model because the, the track structure is actually very, very long anyway. So we need a very big 3D model. If we had nonlinearities, we'd have to do proper um, 3D modeling. But for, for linear models, it's, it's very effective. So we've used that for um, a number of um, calculations, one in particular in a European project where we looked at the <coughs> mitigation of surface vibration using um, trenches or ground barriers at the side of the track. Uh, if we fill that, bar that trench with a soft material, it's much less effective than if it's just an open trench, but an open trench won't stay there. So. Um, realistic solutions are, are quite difficult. We also looked at stiffening under the track, and that will give uh, some benefit, depending on the, the soil structure. And then we've also used it, I haven't put pictures in, but used it for predicting the vibration from, from a tunnel and the, the noise inside uh, buildings. The same 2.5D model we've used for other applications, such as bridge noise. This is a Chinese metro bridge. Um, which is uh, quite a common structure in China, but it's a little bit too flexible, produces quite a lot of noise, low frequencies. And we used it for interior noise. So the um, modern uh, rail vehicle is an aluminium extrusion, which if you took the aluminium and squashed it flat, it would be about 10 dB better in terms of noise insulation than using the actual structure we've got. It's very efficient structurally, it's quite poor acoustically. So we're looking at ways of optimizing that using the, the, the modeling approach. Um, and finally, just for fun, um, we've um, used some public engagement money to, to build a superb LEGO model. So this is a science and engineering festival at Southampton. Every year we get about 7,000 visitors, mainly school children, trying to enthuse them about science and engineering. And we thought, wouldn't it be a good idea to build a railway layout? So the, the Lego model, there's a building on the, on the right there which contains two little accelerometers. And the girl on, on the left, she's listening to the noise inside those buildings as the train goes past. And it sounds quite realistic. Um, the the, the two buildings, one of them is isolated and one is not. And you can hear the difference. And um, then you can also see the signals on the screen. So a bit of fun and um, quite... Um, entertaining. So to um, make some kind of concluding remarks, the, we've seen that operational railways will never be silent. We're going to get more noise and vibration problems if we increase traffic and increase speed unless we do something about it. Theoretical models are really key to understanding noise and vibration. If we just try to do something without understanding there's a danger we'll get into those fail situations we had earlier. Um, really complex models are not necessarily the best because you don't necessarily get the insight. So finding appropriate models to give you insight is really important. We can then design suitable noise control measures, but it's really quite a challenge to get them beyond the research phase into implementation because there is quite a resistance in railways as, well, as anywhere to importing risk into their network and anything unconventional is seen as risky. So that is a challenge for the future, is to, um, is to see these things implemented. And just to acknowledge uh, an awful lot of people who've contributed to this research over the years. I won't read the names out, but um, those are just some of the people, but they're the ones whose results I've been showing in, in the presentation. Um, there are many others as well. So um, thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you.